Okay, hi, so here's another um, episode of Real Talent. I'm with Michael Hines and uh, really looking forward to finding out what you've got to say. So, Michael, could you just give us a bit of background? What's your, tell us about your CV. So, I started in television directing uh, in the early 90s. Uh, I got a job at BBC Education in Edinburgh to work on uh, some stories about children going from primary school to secondary school about being bullied and to allay the fears kids might have of that age of changing schools and everything that that might bring. Um, and then from that point, BBC Children's uh, became a centre for excellence in Glasgow. And I got an interview to go over and learn to direct multi-camera for Children's. I went, got the job, went over there, went on a couple of training courses and spent the next four years uh, working out of Glasgow, doing Saturday morning kids shows, uh, live entertainment shows, and the, the joy of working in children's television is you work across all genres. So I did sport, I did entertainment, I did music, I did comedy, I did drama, multi-camera and single camera. And there's not a great deal of us left directors who will do multi and single camera. And then in the year 2000, I got offered a full-time role as heading up children's drama in BBC uh, Glasgow. But at the same time, I got an offer to go and do a sketch show called Chewing the Fat. And I really enjoyed meeting the two guys who did Chewing the Fat. And I decided to carry on directing. And from there, I got offered uh, probably the thing I'm best known for, which is the network sitcom Still Game, uh, and ended up directing over 20 years, all 62 episodes, uh, winning a few BAFTAs and other awards on the way, I'm delighted to say. But uh, essentially, I'm a jobbing freelance uh, TV director, and I've done Biker Grove, I've worked for MTV, I do commercials, I've done soap operas. Um, and in Scotland... There isn't enough work to be able to specialize purely in one area and make a comfortable living from it. So I spend half my time doing multi-camera OBs, uh, outside broadcasts, uh, a live Hogmanay show in Gaelic. I did for about five years, which was very interesting. 300 people with a lot of drink in a foreign language. That was very entertaining. Uh, and then doing uh, single camera comedy the rest of the time. I also started my own television production company in 2013 that uh, will pitch for and make comedies and we've done quite a few programs that have won awards as well for BBC Alba, MG Alba, the Gaelic Broadcasting Channel. So that's great fun. And we're currently in development because right now nobody's actually making anything. No, of course. But you've got personal, um, you've got personal news at home, having become a dad very recently. And so, what a great time to be! Uh, what a great time to be locked down. Probably the best that time to be locked down. That's right. Uh, baby Rose was born on the literally the eve of lockdown. And I think I was probably the last father to be to be allowed in the hospital before we all got booted out. Yes. Uh, and they said the next day, you can come in and visit for an hour, choose your time slot. Uh, and I hid behind the curtain from Matron for about three hours and yeah. uh, got away with it. But yeah, she's doing well. And we've had a great time obviously bonding with her because we're not allowed to see anyone else. Yes, of course. OK, let's talk about talent. You've hired a lot of people over the years for different things. And um so my question is, uh, how do you know when you find somebody with real talent? What, what sort of things do you look for? Uh, I think the question is fascinating because there's, there's two main areas that we tend to hire for. One is behind the camera, lights, sound, makeup, costume, so on. Uh, and obviously in front of the camera when you're auditioning and casting. Mm. And I think it boils down to, first of all, make sure you ask the right question. What is it I need? Now that's easy when you're doing a casting because say for instance, I need a 20 year old male uh, who can do a good Glaswegian accent, who can ride a motorbike, then you're unlikely to get Meryl Streep popping by as fantastic as an actress she is. So if you ask the right question, what will happen is you'll get a range of options that should be within those parameters. And it's up to you at that point to work out what suits you best. Now, if you don't define exactly everything, they have to be five foot eight, they need to be dark haired, they need to have a West Coast accent, they need to have blue eyes, then suddenly what happens is you're, you're allowed flexibility in looking for that. And sometimes what will happen is uh, your expectations will be changed by someone who will perform in a completely different manner to how you might have expected the lines to do. And so long as you've got the speed of thought to say, well, actually that would fit in with everything else I've got, but it's refreshing and different, then that stands out, we might call it screen presence. Um, and I think when you're looking for real talent, it's important that you ask the right question, but you don't absolutely exclude everyone else. So you give yourself the opportunity to find something fresh and new and different, uh, but at the same time still allowing what you'd hope for to appear as well. And it's up to you to make that decision. Uh, interestingly, when we do auditions, I will record them 
uh, on camera, but I only record the performance because out with the performance, I might have a really good chat or a really bad conversation with someone who might be grumpy or late or tired or have been rained on and they're not in the best mood. And although their attitude is absolutely important that they're in the show uh, as an actor, if they can act and do the part how I want, that's all I'm really interested in. It's quite Machiavellian. Beyond that, I'm delighted if we get on with them, but if they can come and do the goods and then go away, that's fine. However, the reverse is almost true for behind the camera. Because if I'm looking for someone to fit within a crew of say 44, 45 uh, people on set, I know that will change in the future, but in the past, that's roughly the average number of people who would be out every day on still game. That I need a team player and someone has the right attitude to come and work on a comedy um, and to be part of a team as well as being able to do the job. And someone once said about me, uh, Michael Hines is a great guy to work for, but he expects you to know your job. And often I think delegating to the heads of the department to find their right people, but making sure that I've had a chat with them to see that they're the right kind of person in their personal skills to fit in. So there's, that's twofold and more tricky perhaps uh, behind the camera. And I think at the end of the day, you'll get a sense of people a lot of people will bullshit, particularly in the creative industries. I once uh, advertised for a guy called Carlos, the Spanish van driver. Everything you needed to know about Carlos is in his title. And I got an actor who will remain unnamed, uh, who said, yes, he could do Spanish. He looked Spanish and yes, he could drive. And the night before his agent put me up and said, he can't drive a van. And many actors have lied over the years. Yes, I can ride a horse. Yes, I can fence, I can pole vault. And then three weeks before spend their waking hours trying to learn that skill. So behind the scenes, you will get CVs. And CVs are interesting, but I think what's absolutely crucial is references and looking up what programs they've worked on and perhaps speaking to other crew who might know them mm. to make sure that their personal skills are as important as their professional qualities. As I said, it's different for front of camera and you will suddenly get um, a feeling or a buzz or a hairs on the back of your neck when someone gives you such a great performance, you think, wow. And that's got to be gut feeling. And I actually think that transfers to most industries you're, you've got to trust your intuition or at the very least know that your intuition is completely wrong and therefore don't trust it. But be aware of your feelings over the years so that when you're faced with a decision about someone's talent, you can make a decision, be courteous and honest about it in your feedback. And most importantly, I'll never ever forget on the other side of that table is someone who wants that job and they're extremely nervous and they're trying to do the best for you. But even George Clooney said, I, I'm not the best sight reader of lines, you know. Um, and, I, and I think that remembering the position that those people are in is absolutely vital because then you can look for the kind of talent that they might have and give them the time to show that without taking all day, of course. Mm. Really interesting. A lot of that translates very well into the corporate world because there will be an equivalent of sort of front of camera and back of camera type people, depending on the sort of job they do. And there are, for those people that are front of camera, actually, yeah, there are certain aspects of their personality that don't matter as much because if they've got the talent you need to get that thing done, you can forgive some other things. Whereas there's other types of jobs where you really do need team players and you need people to. I think um, you're absolutely right. I think mm -hmm. what's interesting is, is for any job in anywhere in the world, can you do the job? Um, and quite often we'll get theatre people who haven't done television. And in the past that used to debar you from doing TV. But the point is, can, not can you do this specific job, but can you do the job in its entirety? So can you act? Not mm -hmm. can you play a 20 year old guy's reaching out, but can you act first and foremost? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, well, let's see them. And the very mere act of have, interviewing someone or bringing them in for a chat should imply to that person that we believe you can do the job. And I believe in those interviews or auditions or coffees or however you do it, you absolutely have to create an environment where they allow what they want to sell to the best. You'll often get, and I've seen it in corporate worlds a lot when I do a lot of uh, commercials and I'm working with clients from big businesses and things like that. People are almost overconfident in trying to oversell themselves and then you poke behind it and, it, and there's nothing there. And uh, equally, I've had some understated, right grumpy buggers who've come for an audition and I've thought I'm wasting my time. And then they, they go and do the role and they spring to life. It tends to be rare, but I think it's, it's, it's as much on us to ask the right question, to be aware of the parameters and within which we're looking for that talent, but to allow flexibility within that area. And don't be so focused that you might miss out on something extraordinary that's presented in a different manner. 
you've probably got a lot of ephemeral relationships within your industry where you work with people for short periods of time, but then you will have others who you've worked, you have worked with for a long time and you will tend to keep close to you on like, all the different kind of productions that you're working on. So um, my question would be around, how do you go about nurturing people? And what, what, is, is, it, is that an active process or, yeah, what's your thoughts about that? It's interesting because it, it, it depends on the hierarchy, whereabouts, at what level they are. Heads of department will tend to be agreed on. I, I, I will be allowed to choose my uh, DOP, my director of photography, my lead camera person, and perhaps my first assistant director. I, I wouldn't expect to tell them who to use for their assistance. That's their job and their world and all the rest of it. Um, certain people have certain styles, just I do of directing. I specialize in comedy. So I'm unlikely to be given a massive drama just as a drama director may have to start lower on the comedy run and work their way through. So executive producers above me will make big decisions about your career and also who you might work with, particularly with named actors. We've got so-and-so on board. They would work really well with so-and-so. Below that level, it's up to you. So it comes down to two things. And one is personal relationships and the other one is realizing potential. Now, I trained martial arts for about 24 years or a long time ago now. And my head teacher, my head sensei was brutal. But I remember once he gave me a grade up and I went to a blue belt and I, I thought I was nowhere near ready for this. And I thought, I'm going to get flattened by the next person who comes up and flings a kick at me. And he said, I can see it in you and giving you more responsibility. You will step up to that. And knowing when that is the time to do that is absolutely crucial. Yeah. Now, in personally, in my job, it's very rare that I will make that decision for someone. But let's look at a camera assistant. You have a camera assistant and a focus puller who makes everything in sharp focus, and then a camera operator and then a lighting DOP. And knowing when to push them and let them go up and try. And in our industry, there's so much money in it. There's no room to fail. There's no room to test someone and say, go and have a shot at that. But if they mess it up, well, there isn't any room. So knowing when to realize someone's potential is really crucial. And knowing whether or not that they will um, step up to that or actually it might shatter them you absolutely have to know the person mm -hmm. so when i'm trying to nurture potential in either actors who are fresh out of college and nervous coming on set or uh, my crew who i want to keep because they fit in really well they get on they've got great ideas and all the rest of it first of all i try and make them feel creatively invested in the project now i'm the last guy to say yes or no creatively but if I allow them the freedom to say, oh, I wonder if we should do this, or I wonder if I should do that, or did you know that that was in there, or I saw a boom shadow or whatever, empowering them to have their voice within the, within the confines of your work means they trust you and they know they'll be taken seriously. So then when you have the conversation and you say to them, do you think you can do this? You're more likely to get an honest answer and they're not trying to either please you or they're not trying to put themselves down. So realizing the relationship is at a right level to have an honest conversation about realizing the potential that's that's absolutely right uh, and then crucial the other thing is talking about relationships that you have your long-lasting relationships with people and directors end up working with their own first assistants and things like that inevitably what will happen is um, jobs will cross over and they're not able to do it um, or the DOP I worked the DOP on Steel Game he did Toast one of my favorite shows did yeah. League of Gentlemen in the first series didn't do the second series a different director came in so I nabbed him and I'm delighted to have him and I would work with him on other things there are certain things he wouldn't be right for and what I think he's right for again goes down to this asking the right question he may think he's right for everything I think I could direct everything clearly I can't you know but um, at the end of the day you need to have a really good honest open conversation with the person who is able to uh, move forward your talent or help you with your talent and that openness and feeling that you are either empowered to be creatively invested to have those conversations means that when you are asked the question, can you do this? And you say, do you know what? Probably not. Then you're not going to shatter yourself or you go, Oh, I hadn't thought about that, but thank you. Then you're trusted. And that's really, really important. Yeah. Very interesting. So, um, the, the next question is about, um, you will have met a lot of successful people throughout your career and both in front of the camera and behind the camera. I'm interested to know if there's any common sort of traits that you've seen in those people. Um, is there anything that you've seen in people that, like uh, uh, across a lot of different people you think, yeah, they've all got the same kind of 
thing, whatever that might be, or not? I think, I think there's a self-centeredness and a confidence that will ultimately take you to the very top. And when you're at the very top of your game, you're often the most friendly, nicest people you'll ever meet. Egotistically wise with actors, if they're on the way down, they become divas or difficult because they're not as famous as they used to be and still want to be. On the way up, um, it depends on your relationship with them. And in comedy in Britain, almost every single writer is in the show. Uh, Catastrophe, Peep Show, Fleet Mag, uh, just to name three off the top of my head, still game. If you think about it, they're always in it. The days of uh, Porridge and Only Fools and Horses where there was team writing and then they didn't do it, are not there. Uh, and I had a long conversation with Peter Kay, the comedian, about why he directs his own stuff. And in comedy, they say that the director gets in the way of it. But in drama, the actors expect and respect um, the authority of the director. So I'm not always the alpha male on a shoot. And when I've looked at who's in charge uh, in shoots, it's the, the people who are most frequently there have got the confidence to speak out and be assured of their voice. In comedy, you can't dilute it. And even writers in drama, you don't dilute it. They need an authoritative single point. And there's a real fine art to sticking to your guns and being stick in the mud. Mm -hmm. And if you come across as confident <clears throat> and assured and don't let your opinion be wavered, if, you're considered, if you consider yourself to be absolutely right, uh, that's what most successful people have. The difficulty comes as if they're wrong, but then they mm -hmm. tend not to be successful as much. And yeah. in front of and behind the camera, having those creative conversations for me, I hope I'm flexible enough that my DOP said, no, I would shoot it this way with this lighting and from this angle, that I understand that would still fit within my plans and I'm happy to do that. And I'll say yes and no. Uh, <clears throat> so it's a confidence and an assuredness that you're right, but the ability to know when you're wrong is the common thing I've seen. And it is confidence and not arrogance. And I have a friend who works with the absolute top A-list uh, music people, films, um, people all the time uh, and and whether it's Beyonce, U2, J-Lo, people like this he's work with Lady Gaga, they're all super polite to people at their level. They can come across as divas elsewhere but w when you get really at the top of your game and you're super polite because you know uh, that you have that confidence that you've done the right thing and the difficulty of course comes when you think you've done the right thing and you haven't. So mm -hmm. it's confidence, assuredness and the, uh, the self-awareness to be flexible. Mm -hmm. That's a difficult mix. Mm. Michael, thank you very much for that. That was really fascinating and it's great to um, learn some uh, insights from the uh, theatrical world, uh, the comedy world in particular, and uh, I've got no doubts that everybody that's uh, watched this has uh, learned some interesting things. So uh, sincere um, gratitude for me for coming and uh, joining me today. No, you're very welcome. It was a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you.